Welcome to the Penga Folder podcast with your host, Nana and Emily. They invest remotely in the UK and live in Sweden. In this podcast, they will be interviewing interesting guests that all invest in the UK property market. Today, we have Robert Smallbone. How is it? Yeah, thank you very much, Nana, for the invitation. Uh, great to be able to feature on the Penga Flood podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I found your podcast. I think it was when I was uh, working, and uh, I like uh, I'm I'm a nomad <laughs> because we <laughs> we were we invest in UK and we live here. But uh, I like traveling. I like. So we share a lot of uh, same uh, interest. You like football? I like football. <laughs> so, yeah. So I stumbled on it and I thought like, okay, why not ask him to jump on our podcast? So who is Robert? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a tough open-ended question <laughs> at the best of times. Uh, oof. Uh, who am I? Um, well, I suppose if... If I'm going to be philosophical about it, I think I don't know because I think we're learning about ourselves every day. So it's difficult to really assess who I am. But if, if you want a sort of a, a brief background, so my traveling, uh, my traveling, my background really is uh, usual stuff. I uh, grew up, went to school, uh, went to university, didn't know any better, got my degree, uh, got like in 2010, then uh, went traveling around Southeast Asia and, and across the USA uh, by land. That's good fun. Uh, came back to the UK, went to, went back to, well, went to work for a couple, two and a half years, um, saved up, went to the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. And then from there, traveled around South America and Central America with what is now my business partner. Um, finished that in 2015, came back to the UK, and you know, we'd had multiple conversations about you know getting involved in property, you know, so many bus journeys and and everything like that. And yeah, I started doing research property wise in 2015. Uh, set up our company, Devoy and Smallbone Properties, in 2016. And, and from there, we've you know every day's a new day, um, mainly by to let investing in the north of England. And one thing's led to another, and yeah, the the host of or co-host of the uh, property nomads podcast as well so that's me in a nutshell yeah okay very interesting first the football i wanted to go to the world cup i really wanted to go before all of this war <laughs> i'm not a fan of that <laughs> no but um, uh, yeah okay <laughs> but that's very interesting. That's what I mean. That's why I said that we share a lot of uh, in the, the same interests, like we're traveling, etc. So, I, if I recall it right, you're based in Hull, right? Uh, yes, at the time of recording, yes, based in Hull in the northeast yeah. or east of England, yes. Yeah. So is that also where you invest or do you invest uh, everywhere? Um, yeah, it, it's the main area for investment. Um, we have, we sort of, we've created this triangle of an investment area. So uh, we, the main area is Hull and we also invest in Burnley, uh, in Lancashire, and then also uh, in the Rotherham area as well. So South Yorkshire. Um, yeah, re reason for that being that we didn't want to put all our eggs in one basket and have it in the same yeah. place. You know, I mean, smart. You know, those, those that know Hull, and I'm not making a scientific prediction for 50 years' time, but Hull is very flat. And, uh, you know, with a concern of rising water levels, you know, that, that, could, that could be challenging in years and years to come, or, you know, for the people that inherit the portfolio, kids or whatever. Um, so we've got this sort of triangle approach as well. But to be fair with you, Nana, it's, you know, if you're going down the sort of a buy-to-let strategy, 
in the north of England, uh, it, it really doesn't matter where you go. You just pick a town and do it. You know, pretty much every town's going to have the similar characteristics. You know, going to have a railway station or, or a bus station. They're going to be relatively well connected, and, and people are, you know, going to rent. So, yeah, that we just picked areas and, and just that's it. So, so this uh, triangle uh, strategy that you guys are doing—that's a uh, I never heard about it. Very smart of you guys. That, like you mentioned, that you diversified. Uh, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Who came up with it, and how? How long is the distance? You know, from each uh, like town or city, if I may ask. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, we didn't really come up with it. We never actually planned it. Uh, we 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 use property sources um for for most of our projects and you know again through networks and for knowing people but we, we got given an opportunity in in burnley and in 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 rotherham and you know we analyzed the numbers we done our homework we looked at the area and you know you mentioned about football ironically that is normally how i associate something it's not does it have a football team but you know It does help, believe it or not. It's it's, it's strange, but it does help. Um, so it, yeah, we didn't plan it. It, it. it just happened. In terms of distances, Hull to Rotherham, probably about an hour um, by car, I'd say, uh, and then from Hull to Burnley, two two and a half hours, um, and then Rotherham to Burnley again, about two two and a half hours. So. It's not that much, yeah. It's not that big a distance, to be fair. So, so w when you jumped, you said you mentioned you use sources, like uh, uh, mostly of of the listeners here. Uh, did you know the areas before, or did you do like a desktop uh, research, and then you were like, okay, this look good, let's go ahead, or did you visit the area? How did you guys move forward? So, in terms of in terms of Hull, there's there's a lot of incentives. Uh, I mean, this was back in 2015, 2016. There was a lot of, of incentives to do with renewable energy. You know, there's some massive for those that are familiar with Hull. There's some you know some massive wind turbines, and wind farms just off of the coast, uh, and you know just off of the in the North Sea. And yeah, renewable energy, whether we like it or not, that's really what's going to happen in the next 20, 30, 40 years in our lifetime is to have this push towards how eco-friendly can we be. And, and, and Hull has, you know, a lot of investment from the local council and also from the government for, you know, for long-term renewable energy. So that's why we ended up in Hull, you know, big, big town, uh, sorry, decent city, um, you know, a, a very big rental town, to be fair, uh, a lot of renters up here. And that was it. You know, I'm from the south of England originally. I'm from a place called Reading, um, but moved up, you know, purposely moved up to Hull just to be, you know, I wanted to be in the local area. I like traveling around. I didn't want to, you know, I'm happy to get involved in a new way of life. And, and that was that. So, but how do we, how do I know Burnley and Rotherham? Um, didn't know the areas particularly well. But again, I'll go, I'll go back to football and I love geography. So, you know, I know where Burnley is. You know, I'd, I'd never been before until this opportunity was presented. But I knew roughly where it was because, again, that's football. But um, I love geography. I'm also a bit of a railway fanatic. Um, so I read a few magazines and there's always different developments going on. So, you know, oh, this train line has been opened or that's going to open or there's going to be something new here. Again, that sounds a bit geeky, but that can provide really incredibly useful economic data. Because if people don't know that, but you know a new railway station's coming, yeah, that, that's key for investment. So, it, 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 yeah, it was a combination. I didn't know much about the areas before we, we started investing. But um, yeah, over time, you again, you get presented with a deal, you do your homework, you do your analysis, you ring around the agents, visit the area. Does, is it going to work? And then you just have to make a judgment call. And, and we did. And, you know, thankfully that the properties have, 
you know, so far so good. Yeah, that that's really funny that you uh, associate with the football because I, I when we started uh, uh, with this property journey, every time we're like, oh yeah, that they have a team, they have a team, yeah, this, <laughs> this, and this because you know you recognize all of the name from the towns from uh, in the football in championship in the Premier League, and you just like ah okay. But you didn't know how many, how much the population and etc. was. But that's really good. And like you said, the the geeky stuff. That's really good stuff because then you're ahead of the game, because you know what's happening with the trail. A majority of people use uh, railway and uh, yeah, motorway. So if you know that, then you you're ahead. So yeah, that's a good geeky tool that you got. <laughs> so what do you think we should think of when doing with sorcerers what question do you ask them oh that's a good question nana i'm quite cynical i like to know everything uh, that's just part of my nature so for me i want to know how long they've been in operation What's the name of the company? You know, search on company's house. What do other people say about them? You know, clients that they've done deals with. Do they have yeah. good deals or do they, you know, if they say it's off market, is it off market? Yeah. It's very easy to, <laughs> you know, have an off market deal that you can then go and find on right move. Um, yeah. I want to know if they've got all their certification in place. You know, do they have AML in place? Uh, so for those that don't uh, know what that is, that's anti-money laundering. Uh, you, as a source, you've got to have that in place. Uh, are they part of the PRS scheme uh, or the property ombudsman? Um, you know, uh, the, the rest, the basic homework I could do myself. I think every investor needs to do the basic homework, you know, about an area. You know, that's important. So yeah, I'll, I'll ask everything. Um, it's, it's a piece, you know, as you've said, many a time before it, it, and as many other people have it's a people business and you know i'd rather ask questions because it works two ways those people don't know what i've got and i don't know what they've got you know for all they know you know they might look at me and go oh no he's another time waster i could be sat with five million pound going if i like you i'll do i'll do a do a day you know but they don't know that yeah you know, I, by the way i haven't for those that don't, don't email me. I haven't got five million pounds in my bank. <laughs> I'll let you know that for now. I will at some point, but, but not now. Um, so, yeah, I want to know everything because there, there's there's so many dodgy people out there that don't understand the rules. And, you know, we've, we've just got to be careful. So, yeah, I, I want to know everything and I will ask a lot of questions. Yeah. So that leads me into... Why do you use sourcers? Why don't you uh, buy your own uh, properties and, you know, do all of the project management, all of this stuff? Is it because you want to be like an armchair investor or, yeah, why? Um, well, multiple reasons. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, well, despite hosting a podcast, I'm not much of a people person. Um, I, I'm really not. Uh, now, the reason for that is uh, I'm, I'm autistic. So I, I fail to get emotions. I don't get people personally. Um, you know, I love doing these recordings and, you know, being on podcasts and hosting podcasts because I love to listen and understand. But I don't, I don't get these subtle clues that, you know, through body language and stuff like that. So now I've learned that over time um, when we started in property it was you know mainly myself doing a lot of the rushing around and getting things done and but i found i was I, I get frustrated very quickly if things aren't done how i like them to be done so you know so aaron and i over time we've just looked at it and gone well okay what system and process works for us um you know of course we've got our network we, we do talk to people and you know most of the opportunities that we do get actually just come from people that we know um but yeah so that, that's probably the main the main reason it's just developing i'm not much of a people person and not because i want 
not because I don't want to be, it's just I don't get people to be fair. So yeah, so being involved in the people business is quite interesting. Um, but Aaron, Aaron takes care of most of that. Um, and I just, I've never really liked the chase of it, to be fair. Um, I love, I like property. I love, I love, I love the information and I love bits and pieces. I, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's really good. But yeah, in terms of like trying to project manage, I am the worst project manager. It, do, do not ask me to project manage anything. I'm useless at it. <laughs> um, but everyone's got their own skill sets, haven't they? And I think if you know yourself, then, you know, that will help your business move forward. And every day is a new day. Yeah, obviously uh, it has moved forward because you've been buying a lot of deals going forward. So as long as, like you say, you just need to be aware of what you're good of and what you're not. And I'm not going to sit here and say I'm good at spreadsheets and etc. But I know my missus is. So why should I even go into that? Even if she really wants me to understand it a bit, how you can do it, etc. But I'm like, I should just focus on, on my strengths and uh, basically that's what you're doing so yeah good good on you there good on you there so that leads me into uh, my third question so what do you think is a reasonable amount paying a sorcerer that depends on the deal that, that. If you're doing a buy to let now, because okay. I, I think that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, or because you, you do buy, you're doing buy to lets, right? Or or do you have a uh, other HMOs and commercial, or you're you're mainly doing buy to lets, if I if I recall it right? That's correct. Yeah, our our, our main strategy is is buy to let. For me, I'm happy to pay. Well, I say I, we are, we're happy to pay around about three thousand. You know, if if the deal if the deal passes our criteria, and you know you got you got two different types of deal. So, right in our opinion, you've got two different types of deal. You've you've got the ones where you can obviously buy below market value, add value, refurb, and you can you know come in and out of the deal relatively quickly. Or we've got the other approach, which is again a very long term approach, is let's just say we've got an investor that's got 50,000 pounds and they are happy to give us the finance for a couple of years. Then depending on the property and what, what's going on, we might just buy the property on with a mortgage for on a two year fixed period, do some work over time. And then in a couple of years time, refinance, give the investor their, their money. So we've got two ways of doing it. And, it depends what approach you want to take with it. But now, in answer to your question, I'd say uh, 3,000 is reasonable. Um, again, it depends on the numbers. If it's a, a true, as they say, money in, money out deal, which, you know, they're, they're not impossible to get. They're, they're rare, but they're not impossible. And I've seen people, you know, charge 5,000 for that. Then, you know, it's a cost of business is the way that I'd look at it. So depends on the deal but 3000 i'd say is ballpark i'd say that's reasonable for a decent buy to let deal yeah okay that's good so that leads me into this question that you meant this is this follow up question you said that you have this second strategy that you do with your investors that you take their money and then uh, you park it and then after 2 years you refinance have you actually done that and see the capital growth uh go up and give back the money to the investor yeah yeah I, i'll give you the most recent example i was um i don't know, again at the time of recording we had a refinance done uh, recently um i bought it for fifty-five thousand a couple of years ago two two and a half years ago uh revalued up at 82 um so we we're able to pull and again taking into account two and a half years of cash flow there from from the rent as well then you know we've been able to pass that money back to the investor and you know that's the most recent example that comes to mind um however, free house pretty much is our approach is long term it's very you know we, we've tried many things we've looked at different things we've had things that have worked things that haven't worked as well and you know Aaron and I take a very very long-term approach 
to it. You know, we're both early 30s. We're going to be doing this in some capacity when we're you know, 50, 60, because we've both got a very long term approach. Um, you know, so, yeah, we're, we're happy to we're happy to, to work like that, because at the end of the day, you know, for us, the, the key thing is the investor. You know, the investor's got to be happy. And if you can build that rapport with the investor and you can build that trust, you know, that, that, that it's not automatic, but that, that, that can lead to a lot of repeat business. And if you're dealing with the same pot of finance, it's, you know, happy days for everyone, really. It's about the win-win situation. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've, you bought a, several uh, source deals. Have you bought a deal that you, uh, it wasn't accurate what they said in the end? Like, did you have complications? Yeah, we, we've had a, a couple of deals we've bought, we've had complications with. Um, you know, re refurbs weren't what they meant to be. You know, prices changing at the last minute. Um, you know, things that have been found in the property that weren't brought to anyone's attention. And I think in that situation, you, you can really do one of two things. You, you can sit and blame everyone else, which is easy to do. Uh, we all love moaning in the UK. Yeah. So yeah, it's easy to sit down and, and blame other people. And sometimes that's correct. Sometimes there are things where it is valid to that it is someone else's fault. But the second time, now no, you've got to look at yourself. And you know, if I if I go back to some of the source deals um that that haven't been as good as they could have been, um sometimes they've been things that I've missed. So I've had to you know, learn that lesson and go, ah, you know, oh, how have I missed that? Right, I'll make a note of it. So next time I'm out and about looking, um, I've got to look for it. Or next time I speak to a source, I've got to ask that question. So it's about learning from those mistakes and not repeating them. And yeah, we have to look at ourselves first. That's important. And it's a two-way street. You know, we cannot just sit here and expect sources to do everything for us. You know, we have to do our own homework, our own analysis and do our own due diligence. So, yeah, it works both ways. When you did this deal where you parked the money, how could you factor in the capital growth? What percentage did you uh, factor in in your spreadsheet or how did you know that, OK, in a two years time, I think we can... Uh, pull out all of the money, give back the money to the investor. So your thoughts on that would be great to. Comes down to luck. <laughs> Comes down to luck. Um, no, that, that, that you've, you've got to do your homework as well. Um, I mean, some of it does come down to luck because at the end of the day, you, you are, when you go to refinance, you are pretty much in the hands of the convey, uh, valuer, you know, if the value is having a good day, you might get a better, a more favorable valuation. Um, you know, even the weather, you know, if it's a nice sunny day, that might help. Um, but no, go, go in, in all seriousness, you've, you've got to do your homework at the start. So we, we will never ever guarantee to our investor that everything's going to be 100%. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be fine because it's property that, you know, forgive my language, that shit doesn't happen. You know, there are always <laughs> yeah. going to be challenges all the time. But, you know, we will do a homework, do the homework on the property. Are you getting it below market value or are you getting it so you can add enough value to, to warrant a refinance uh, to get the right valuation that you need? So you have to run your numbers. We don't have a you know, a special calculator for analyzing capital growth because you make your money when you buy in property. Yeah. You know, common, yeah. common rule. That. That's true. So, um, yeah. Um, so, so you've got to do your homework and, and, and a little bit does, does come down to luck. You know, what's your refurb like? What's, you know, is a valuer, believe it or not, is a valuer in a good mood on the day of the valuation? You know, are you the first property they're visiting because they're going to be more alert? You know, if they get tired at the end of the day, they're a bit, uh, you know, that might not work in your favor. Um, and, and also, um, hopefully the FCA aren't listening to this. Always put a slightly higher valuation when you speak to your broker. 
you know, if, if, you, if you're aiming for 75, for example, put down you think the property's worth 85. Even if you know it's not, put down a higher number. Because if you get downvalued, you might still end up with the result you wanted in the first place. Uh, I learned that the hard way. So that's probably a little extra tip mm. of information. Just put down a slight, don't make it ridiculous, but, you know, put down a slightly higher valuation. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing good property, you want to make sure that your property is the best one in the street. And that should be evident when the valuer walks in. That was a really good tip for you listeners and for even for me. That was a really good tip. So when when you uh, meet the valuer or if the, if it's the sourcer, uh, do you know what they bring with them? Uh, is it comparables? What what do they do and how should people act and etc.? Yeah, again, I'll answer this the best as I can. So I'm not overly in tune, in tune with people. So I'll do what I can. Um, Sometimes I've attended, sometimes the tenant's been in and the tenant's dealt with it. Sometimes the lettings agent has, has dealt with it because, you know, despite the fact I live in Hull, you know, I don't, I'm not ridiculously hands-on because we've got to start planning for, you know, when we're traveling around the world, we're not going to be in the country to deal with it. So we have to put the trust in our power team to do that as well. So, um, I mean, I, I always would prepare a little pack. You know, so, so you do your own homework, you know, go on right move, get those links, get the comparables as well. Um, have a, some photos of what the property looked like before and then what the property looks like, you know, look like after the refurb was done. Um, list any works that have been done, but don't put the price down. Just list the works that have been done if you have done works in the property. Um, present that in a, a nice little, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven page document um, as well. Put it in a, a little plastic wallet and give it to the valuer on the day. Um, some valuers, every value is different. You know, some won't care that you're giving it to them. Some just don't care. Some will take it and say thank you. They might never look at it. Uh, and, and some will look at it because you've effectively done their job for them when they come up with a valuation. So everyone's different, but it's these little things that can have a massive difference because doing something like that is, could lead to, you know, a different valuation, which could be favorable. It, in terms of, say now I've completely forgot the point I was gonna make, I was gonna make another good point there, but I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, but, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, that was it. Um, for me, if a valuer turns up, let them do their job. Do not follow them around the property. Let them into the property. Let them do their job. You know, they don't need to know. You know, you do not need to walk around and go, oh, there's a kitchen. It's like, yeah, I can see that. Thanks. Yeah, I know what a kitchen looks like. You know, you don't have to tell them that. Um, I, I let them in. They do their job. Be courteous. You know, even if they're a miserable person, just be courteous. Be nice. Be, be friendly. Be smiley. Give them the document. Let them do their job. They can go home. Uh, and you can go home as well. So just, just don't happy days. Yeah, don't follow them around. Don't be a nuisance. Um, I, uh, as I say to them, you know, if you've got any questions, let me know. I'm just going to wait outside, and I'll let you do what you need to do. They're in charge. They got. They're in charge at the end of the day. Yeah. So that leads me into this COVID stuff because we're in this COVID stuff here in Sweden and in UK, the whole world. How do you think moving forward now with the mortgages, etc., are you going for the fixed term, like five years, two years, or, yeah, what's your take on that? Well, I was asked this recently on a, another interview that i done, and uh, I went off on one for about 20 minutes about economics and how the world <laughs> is bollocks. Um, you know, we're screwed, but I'll try not to do that again. But um, I thought it was good. If, I think what you can do is check out the Property Nomads podcast because I've actually, we've cut the clip down, so you've just got that answer. So go check that out. Um, I'll leave that in the show notes so people can listen to it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, in answer to your question, though, um, tough. Really, the bro it depends on your strategy and it depends what your broker advises you as well, to be fair. Uh, at the moment, we're 
doing a lot of five year fixed because you know it, if, if we strip back and let, let's just look at the very basics here of, of economics of what's going on as, as we record this so you might have a lockdown you might not have a lockdown of course here in england you know we've got at the moment probably we've got lockdown but it, let's break this down as simply as we can we have our economy or you know to be fair the worldwide economy is is going downhill going massively massively downhill and the response that governments or, or central banks have had is they're just printing. They're printing and printing and printing and printing and printing currency, which, you know, okay, that's okay for, well, it's not okay, but the perception of the people is that's okay for the short term. But in the medium term and long term, that is, it, it's going to be like Armageddon in, in the next five years, and it's going to be brutal for everyone. And that's what will happen. The challenge that we've got though, is that because some genius in Westminster come up with this idea of uh, changing stamp duty, all this pent up demand from the first lockdown and investors as well as regular people that are, are buying and selling houses to move, because of the change in stamp duty, they've kind of um, not exploded the market, but all this pent up demand has just been unleashed on the property market. And you know, it's created bidding wars and, you know, stuff like that here and there. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like at the end of March, but the point I'm trying to make is that in a time when most of the world is either in a recession or we're having this massive depression that we're, we're a part of, and it's going to be around, it's going to be generational, whether we like it or not, that housing seems to still be shining. And, you know, that's scary because to me, that's, that is an anomaly. That's a bubble. And you know, all you've got to do is study history, study cycles, and you've got to realize that bubbles will burst. So I'm a bit skeptical from that. And I think that, that don't get me wrong, for people that are listening to this, don't take what I say as, oh, it's doom and gloom. It's the end of the world. There are always opportunities in property, no matter where we are in the cycle. Every good entrepreneur, entrepreneuress, entrepreneurial person, we'll find a way to make money it, it that, that's life but you've got to look at the reality of it you know the the, the psychological impact of the housing market in a moment it is it's people are looking at it positively well that's good for that's good for the economy despite everything else that's going on but the virus isn't going away the lockdowns aren't going to go away because people are still moving you need to stop everyone from doing everything and create a vaccine that's years away in my opinion and yeah economically it concerns me so that's why we're looking at five year fixed and, and we're not doing too much buying at the moment because our instincts tell us or Aaron and myself that at some point in the next maybe it's 2021 maybe it's 2022 maybe it's 2023 it will burst and when it bursts of course stuff will go down and that's where you want to be again cash rich um, and not be revaluing your properties so that, that's why we're looking at five year um, at the moment and you know I understand that that might be stuff that people don't want to hear and they might think uh, you know Rob you're just being skeptical you're just being over cautious no no that's economics you know you've got you've got to understand yeah. this and that's what's happening it's, it's dangerous and not many people are seeing it because we're controlled by you know we're effectively we're being controlled by this virus but as a society We've not had to deal with this for over 100 years. Spanish flu is the last one. That was 100 years ago. So we can have a recession all day long. That's fine. That's not a problem. That's not an issue. But when you put a virus in and you put a pandemic in, it's a different story. And if people want to kick around with their everyday lives, and again, I get it. I understand that if you work in a theatre or you're working at a restaurant, you know, the fear of, being made redundant and not having your job and the pressure that puts on you to pay your bills and pay your rent. I get all that. And that's, unfortunately, that is just part of what people are going to have to go through. But also, Nana, I would hope that's why, you know, I know we spoke recently, you got into property for various reasons, but this is also why people like yourself, ourselves, people listening to this, that's why you get into property. Because when the shit hits the fan, yes. like it's gonna, if you're cash flowing okay, you can you can ride it out and 
you know, hey, yeah. but five year fixed mortgages. Yes, that's why, because we're looking at the economics and going, yeah, we don't want to be refinancing in a couple of years because we, we, we do think that it's, there's going to be something's going to pop. And yeah, you don't want to be refinancing then because you're just going to get yourself into a negative equity situation, which you know isn't necessarily good. Yeah, that's a good good answer. And I really, uh, I'm also really geeky with the micro <laughs> economics because you need to know what's actually happening. And I don't understand all of this stuff that's really happening in the UK or even in Sweden. It seems like everywhere in the world, people, house prices are just going up. It doesn't make sense. People are redundant, like you said, and they're just printing money. It seems like people are just living in this bubble, you know, and uh, when it breaks or when it cracks or pop, that's uh, when the shit hits the fan, like you said. And that's when you want to be and buy, like you're saying. Yeah. So definitely, totally agree it, with you. It's, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but it, to me, this is scary that people don't seem to understand. Property investors don't seem to, most property investors, not everyone, I get everyone, you know, but most people don't seem to understand this because they're, they're trying to ride this crest of the wave and going, everything's gold and everything's great. Trust me, it ain't going to, it's not going to be, but it's a market cycle. It's going to go down, you know, it's going to get worse and then it'll get better. And then, you know, we'll go through the cycle again that just look at the history of it. You know, there's, there's so much out there. Um, you know, it will have bad history times. History always we'll repeats itself. hundred percent, a hundred percent. But uh, that, that's me ranting. I've just gone off on one, but yeah, it, I believe people need to understand this more uh, because it will help them make the decision that goes back to your question about what sort of mortgages Always speak to your broker, of course, but if you get a, if you get a little understanding of economics, that might help you to make a decision about what the most appropriate mortgages are to go for, because it helps your overall strategic plan. Yeah. So, uh, what do you see in the current market? Market the changes that have happened, like the demand for uh, property and etc. Um, what type of demand? I think, uh, I'll just go back to the stamp duty changes, to be fair, where, where they've relaxed stamp duty. And again, that has a really positive impact on, on regular people that are looking to move houses. Um, you know, the, 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 all this demand from this first lockdown has just unleashed itself onto the market. And I know the government are looking at different planning rules and changes and to help make things like that a lot simpler. That's absolutely fine. That's not an issue, but for me, yeah, I just see that there's a lot of demand out there and there's a lot of competition. And that doesn't concern me, but certainly in the last lockdown and the one that we're going to go through in a minute, is I've taken a lot of time to take a step back really from property and actually just focus more on the economic side and go, what's going on here? And, you know, as you've just said, it doesn't add up. You know, so... Yeah, uh, maybe I'm a bit more cautious than most, possibly. And it's not about me, you know, it's not about I'm right, you're wrong, or, or you know, when it goes bad, oh, hate to say I told you so, I'm the best. It's not, it's not about that. It's about how I look at things. Uh, and you, you, of course, you love macroeconomics as well. We're looking at things a bit differently here and going, hmm, doesn't add up, something doesn't add up here. And <laughs> look at the history where when it doesn't add up, it's going to go down. And that's what I think will happen personally. Yeah, and I think as well, because both of us are looking for it in the long run. So even if we sit out, sit this out one year, two years or whatever. Yeah, OK, it's one, two years, but we're still safe and the investors money, they're safe and still we have deals that are cash flowing. So it doesn't matter you in the meantime as long as you don't you know people sometimes they rush just to expand you know and then when you expand too quickly you just there's no way back yet, or it's a very long way back so i think your approach is uh, is is great and, and, and at the end of the day as well you know if, if your property is worth a hundred thousand pounds and your cash flow in 200 pounds a month then that's great if your property's worth one pound, but you're cash flowing 200 pound a month, 
doesn't make a difference, does it? It's all about the cash flow. So, yeah. So, what's your why? Why are you doing this? I know you mentioned a, a bit of it, but like, do you really have a big why? Why? Travel is is a main thing. Uh, that that that's the thing that yeah. drives us. And and again, that's difficult at the moment. You know, um, so yeah, travel is what drives us. We want to create this. I'm not. I, I hate using the word legacy, but you know, we we are thinking. You know that. Well, okay. We want to create a legacy. <laughs> there you are. So we want to create this. Um, you know, thing that's going to stand the test of time, and that we can pass on as well. You know, I'm sure that you know Aaron's going to have. I, I imagine that Aaron will have kids of his own in the future. I'll probably have kids in the future you know what happens then I don't, I don't know that's too far ahead to think about but really travel uh, travel and sport because we love you know we're lucky enough to go to brazil in 2014 um yeah i mean admittedly we did went we we, you know, we worked for that and saved for it but you know moving forward you know i want to go you know we want to go to if it if it still happens you know qatar 2022 uh you know rugby world cups you know cricket world cups you know we, we love that whole camaraderie but we also we also love going off the beaten track and you know we know that if there's assets behind us and the right people are in the right place with the right systems then you know we're going to be able to do that um but yeah, that, that's it as well and you know we have a duty to other people that want to become financially free in property as well you know people want a, a decent return on their cash just like everyone you know you do the same with your investors in sweden you know Go with the knowledge, build that trust, build that rapport. And if you can help them, and you can also help yourself at the same time and create a win-win situation, you know, that's, that's absolutely perfect. So, but no, I, I want to visit every country in the world by the time I'm 50. That's my main driving force. That's my main aim. Uh, and also, you know, to, to have more time to do other things, you know, study new things, visit new places. So that, that's what keeps me going. Wow. What tips can you give us as international investors? What with regards to investing in property? Yep. Okay. Or in the UK in property. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, course, sort of goes in, goes in hand <laughs> with what we just said. Uh, understand economics. Number one, understand it. You know, you're never going to get perfect timing, but you can always get good timing if you like you know if you study hard enough um yeah one would be understand economics number two there's always opportunities so it doesn't matter where we are what's going on there's always opportunities investing internationally take time to build up your network take time to study people work with people and again i say this from you know what i've learned over the years um takes time to build up trust you know there's going to be many people out there that want you know to earn a quick a quick buck and you know there are as it, and as with any industry you know there's going to be bad people out there just be careful um get involved in the right you know networks listen to the right podcasts you know like of course this one r1 there's multiple podcasts out there you know get that information that's key um read books and i've written a couple of books as well uh, you can go check them out um I'm sure we'll mention that at the end anyway. And just soak up that information like a sponge. But yeah, take time to build the network. Don't just rush into something. You know, take time to analyze it, understand it. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes. And, you know, hey, in property, sometimes that costs money. But that is what it is. You, you know, it's part and parcel of business. Don't be afraid. And uh, as you've pointed out greatly, Nana, is know your why, why you're doing it. You know, for me, it's travel. For you, it's your daughter. And, you know, everyone's everyone's why is going to be different. So, yeah, uh, um, a multitude of things, really. I mean, there's a lot of great content out there. You know, um, you know, I've done training and this and that. You don't have to do it. I mean, I advise that you do. There are some, there is some good stuff out there. But you can get a lot of information from books and podcasts and, you know, just, just go out there and, and do it really um, i think there's about 10 things there hopefully they're all useful <laughs> that's good that's good you you cover a lot but that's good so i have this question that i ask all of my listeners if you had 
unlimited funds, who would you get as a mentor? If I had unlimited funds, who would I get as a mentor? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it can be, it doesn't have to be property. It can be everything. All right. I would say, uh, you caught me off guard. I'm just going to say Jeff Bezos. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, one of the richest Why? guys in the world. Uh, saw, you know, massive gap in the market. Uh, that was 20, 25 years ago. You know, and there's still, there's even more gaps that have appeared in the market. Go from strength to strength. And, you know, if you're going to become the best, you want to learn from the best. So I'd say Jeff Bezos, but that's just off the top of my head. Um doing wonders with Amazon. It's one of the, you know, if you want to order something, it's normally the first place you go to, isn't it? So you got to be doing something right. Yeah. They, they come, they came to Sweden uh, this uh, month, actually, or end of October. So we, in Sweden, we didn't have the real Amazon. So now we have uh, Amazon Sweden. So they came and I think they will just explode here in Sweden. I already ordered two, two, two stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, you usually have to pay for this uh, uh, expenses, like the not the toll, but the transport and etc. When you're buying stuff from the UK or Germany, but now when it's in Sweden, you everything is free. <laughs> it is. It, it is what it is. It's, I say you must be doing something right because you know multi-billion pound company there so yeah I'd, I'd say yeah Je off the top of my head before I start thinking about it and change my mind Jeff Bezos is, is who I go for <laughs> Jeff Bezos so Robert if people want to get hold of you the podcast and uh, see you on social media and yeah everything I don't know if you have yeah all of you just let it out there <laughs> no thanks for that I really, I really appreciate <laughs> that so uh, I'm lucky enough to have written two books um, one is buy to let how to get started and uh, the other is the other one I co-wrote with Aaron and that's 101 top property tips uh, they're available on Amazon so you can know, go and check them out and I'm sure the links will be in the show notes in terms of the podcast yeah the property nomads podcast yeah go and check us out we're on all the you know major platforms uh, Stitcher iTunes Spotify that sort of stuff uh, we, we've got a, a wide range of content you know, mostly property related, but we do dip into other things as well. Uh, we release every Monday and then sometimes I'll do uh, a ranty episode uh, every Thursday <laughs> on most Thursdays. So go and check us out there. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We're not too proficient on social media, as you found out. Uh, we don't rep always reply straight away, but we're working on that. Um, but the easiest way to contact me without a shadow of a doubt is email. And that is rob at tpnpodcast.com I'm quite responsive on email and that is the, always the best way to get hold of me okay so there you have it listeners contact Rob and listen to his podcast get his books and even try to get him to be more interactive on social media <laughs> he's very old school with email no but uh, just kidding uh you should go and listen to his podcast. It's very good. I've listened to it several times. And I like your rants because they're valuable. And uh, I think if you're geeky like you and me, it's very uh, interesting topics that you bring up when you're doing your rants, I think. Uh, but uh, that's that's for the listeners to uh, decide as well. And I appreciate that, Nana. Kind words. I just try and be myself. You know, I'm not perfect. And uh, I've got a different view from most people in the world so i'm just happy to be myself and uh, i'd just like to say a massive thank you to you know yourself emily as well who's not here today for giving the time today to be able to record this so a massive thank you to yourself as well and uh, you know all the best moving forward thank you thank you the same so people don't be stressed invest bye